Hello, everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city, Hollywood. Um, so when we look into the future, if you look at the recent assessment report six from the IPCC, uh, they are very much uh, talking about um, unprecedented uh, environmental impacts, uh, extreme weather events. Uh, we are looking at severe impacts on food and energy systems. Uh, and we could even start seeing in severe impacts by the 2030s. I mean, you're starting to see impacts on food systems already. There's plenty of documented uh, issues already uh, in the 2020s. Uh, by the time that we get to the 2040s, 2050s, you're talking about significant percentage increases in the possibility of multiple yield failures in, in crops around the world uh, at a much higher rate uh, than we had previously seen. Um, and so, you know, by 2050, what I often sort of talk, try to try to really impress upon people is we are talking about food price spikes. And when we see food price spikes, say like we did in the in 2007 2008 you see a social unrest and you see all of the sort of civil uh, issues that you see uh, around the world if you love listening to this show please consider giving a rating and a review on amazon alexa or wherever you listen we want to continue bringing you this amazing content and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. So I'm joined by Dr. Paul Behrens, Associate Professor in Energy and Environmental Change at Leiden University and the author of The Best of Times, Worst of Times, Futures from the Frontiers of Climate Science. Welcome to the show today. Lovely to join you, Scott. So Paul, tell us about your research areas in the area of food, energy, and climate change. Well, I work at looking at how we fit on the planet for the long term. Uh, so I work on large scale models, uh, often economic and environmental models, to really trace how our impacts are seen across the planet and the environment. Uh, I work mostly in food and energy um, and how those two different systems, which are the main systems driving climate change, uh, both impact the planet and how they will be impacted by climate change and how we can change things to improve them so that we reduce the future harm. Okay, so we're going to actually come back to that a little bit, but I want to go back a, a, a bit to, to your studies at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, and there, I think you developed some techniques for improving wind energy generation in the mountainous terrain. I wonder if you could share a little bit about that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, my background is actually in physics. Um, and when I did my PhD, I worked on how to how to place turbines better uh, when you're in mountains. When you look at uh, the complex wind flow over mountainous terrain, what you can often have is very strong shear forces. Uh, and those shear forces from the wind, because it can be quite turbulent, can really affect the generation that you're actually gonna get out of a wind turbine. It can also affect the economics of that wind turbine because if you're putting uneven forces on the blades due to all of this turbulence, then you're looking at um, greater operations and maintenance. You're talking more uh, problems with the gearboxes, these sorts of things. So I worked on ways in which you could actually measure the wind speed over those uh, that complex terrain in a remote sense so that you wouldn't have to put up masts every single hundred meters in order to figure things out. You could actually pulse sound into the atmosphere or lasers into the atmosphere, record the returns that you get off mm. the atmosphere mm. and then figure out the wind speed. So yeah, it was uh, it, it exciting uh, technology uh, and applied to a very interesting uh, and useful uh, output. And for something like that to get a you know, set of measurements that everyone can depend on that it then translates into actual development of those wind, wind turbines, uh, is, is it a longitudinal kind of a study uh, to, over several seasons, for example, because recognizing that, you know, wind velocity and direction, all these things are going to change depending. Yeah, on yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the, the, so what you typically want to do in a wind resource assessment uh, when you want to actually figure out how much energy you're going to make and therefore how much money you're going to make on a site, uh, you want to get the full spectrum of the seasons and the annual variation as much as you can. You still might get surprised by a, a year that's a lull in, in wind speeds, uh, but you want to be on top of it. So um, 
clearly that's one of the major challenges to this is that yes you can put up lots of masts and measure all the way along and put them there for a very long time that's going to cost you a lot of money especially in complex terrain when you think about those masts and how tall they are and how wide the guy wise have to go out you're looking at taking them down the side of the mountain you know <laughs> um so what you want to do is you want to um have technologies like this uh, that can sit there for a significant amount of time sorry there's a bit of noise there there's a significant amount of time and um uh, then correlate them against the mast measurements so that you have some ground truth uh, and then extrapolate from that going forwards. So there's a complex sort of uh, modeling approach there as well once you look at the entire wind farm site. And it's challenging because it's one thing if the data set's been available for the last 30 years, you may be measuring something that's very specific to a particular facade or side of the mountain, for instance. So the time period that you're measuring is fairly small in terms of longitudinal sample size. So when you're trying to extrapolate, you, know, you really have to have a lot of uh, gives and takes and, and, and disclaimers, so to speak, right? Yeah. So what the companies and what wind resources assessments fo focus on is trying to get at least two years. You try and get two years of mass measurements at least. And then you try and fill in the, bl the blind spots, the blank spots in between the masts with remote sensing or other sorts of modeling exercises. These can be modeling exercises like computational fluid dynamics. Uh, they can be uh, modeling exercises, even simpler things like, you know, you take the closest um, estimate, long range, long term estimate, say from a from an airport or something like this, and then you correlate it over the period that you do have, and then you try and backcast to see what the wind, the wind speeds were like, and see, then try and get a frequency uh, distribution of wind speeds in the future. So there's lots of different ways to try and use different proxies of it, but you're absolutely right. You need to um, try and aim for that two years. As, as far as you can. Now, where this comes in, of course, is that then, you know, the bank that you're lending the money, that's lending the money to you for building the turbines, if you don't have that on your books, um, then wants to see all the resource assessments for that. And then the bank will often tell you exactly, you know, how much data they want and how much, you know, uh, 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 sort of uh, robustness they want on that. It's really interesting, actually. That brings me uh, uh, to a point. Um, I don't think we have time for today, but there are companies that's actually trying to measure sensors or Internet of Things that can then help feed into securitization or pricing models, kind of like what you're talking about. Right, right. Um, since we're on the topic of New Zealand, and I think New Zealand is, uh, is a really great example for our conversation, uh, it's probably one of the most beautiful and pristine countries in the world. And I got to believe that you have probably through some of these projects, as well as just living there during your PhD program, seen the effects of climate change in person. In New Zealand, uh, yeah, I mean, well, New Zealand is actually one of the regions that will um, see, uh, has a lot of natural disasters, uh, but as yet uh, hasn't seen the full sort of climate impacts. It, it, uh, now, New Zealand is somewhat insulated from the rest of this sort of global climate system. And so it's one of the regions why you will see um, the effects of climate change uh, emerge later there. They will emerge there, uh, especially in the Canterbury Plains, where a lot of the agriculture is, um, but they will be uh, later, which is Honestly, why you're also seeing uh, a lot of the sort of um, sort of escape uh, uh, actions by uh, uh, billionaires and things is quite a political point. But I, I think this is a really bad trend. Uh, it's, it sets up the wrong expectations of society that we're not in this together. Um, but this is one of the reasons why it's seen as the bolt hole of the rich. Um, so quite honestly, I haven't seen a lot of uh, uh, climate impacts there. I've seen a lot of environmental impacts and natural uh, disaster impacts. Um, so they have very bad water quality in New Zealand due to the uh, animal agriculture there. Um, and they also have obviously earthquakes and, and, and um, uh, eruptions. I've seen far more impacts in Europe. So uh, when I move back to Europe, uh, I see it every single year now, every single year summer goes around. I went to see to the Eiffel to see the flooding there in Germany uh, the, in the, in, and in the Ardennes in, in Belgium last year, which were just off the charts, off, off what we thought was possible in terms of the climate models. Um, so I've seen far more in Europe. Yeah, I think I was in Amsterdam not too long ago, just a few months ago, and just you know, seeing how that particular region has learned to adapt with rising water, as an example, and for other regions, it's becoming very problematic. And to your point, I mean, I was in Helsinki a few years ago, uh, probably more normal than it was, uh, I think, more in recent years, but it's become so unusual, even during the peak of the winter, to actually have relatively warm weather. Now, you wrote this uh, book, Best of Times, or Worst of Times, Future from the Frontiers of Climate Science that's uh, recently come out last year uh, to the U.S. market. 
How is this different from many of the climate crisis and Act Now books that are out there in the marketplace? Yeah, thanks. Great question. What I found was a lot of books that you get out uh, from uh, popular science, they're very, very, um, they're well written, they're very interesting, but you often have uh, 90% very negative um, information, uh, 80 to 90% uh, spelling out just how dire the situation is. And then a final sort of 10 to 15% of like, oh, you know, well, there are these solutions. You never quite know how this fits with the bigger system. You also have this whole set of books that talk about how humanity is uh, getting better over time, lifespans are going up, uh, that food insecurity is going down. That's that's no more, by the way. Um, But there's a lot of books out there sort of extolling how how far we've come uh, as a species. So what I wanted to do was really commit to these uh, different pictures uh, to really commit to what is the pessimistic take. Um, And that's not a pessimistic take of some wild extrapolation. That's the scientific information on what food yields are looking like by 2030, 2040, 2050, uh, what the energy system is doing to us every year in terms of pollution in the atmosphere, killing 7 million people prematurely every year, uh, hundreds of thousands uh, around the world in in rich countries. We often think about that as being uh, uh, developing or middle income nations that are are seeing the air pollution Uh, and really then spelling out what it looks like if we were to address this problem. Technology is not enough. uh, Social change is not enough. We need both of those at the same time in a very sort of emergency uh, uh, approach uh, and grounded all the way through uh, by the science, uh, by uh, the research that's actually being done with, with the models, the climate models, with the modeling that we do as well in terms of trying to fit on this planet for the long term. Um, So it's really by setting out that case for what happens if we continue and then setting out the case for the hope and how much better the world would be because of it, that you really got that vision gap. And then but hopefully by ma- mapping out that vision gap for people, they can really see how much there is to play for and how much better the world would be if we actually just get on and do the things that we know we need to do if we have a long-term uh, future on this planet. You know, I think one of the things that I've took away uh, after graduate school was this notion that there's so much data, so much insights and, you know, models and systems that you're talking about that we can look to. And yet, uh, conveniently, whether it's politicians, pundits, or others, choose to put that aside. And I wonder, in this day and age of disinformation and misinformation, do you believe that so far this type of a data approach has been enlightening? It's a really good question. And that's why in my book, I do talk about it, why it's not just what we can measure. It's also really importantly about the broader systems change. So yes, there's a period of disinformation, but you can, yes, and yes, we've got a lot of models and yes, we have a lot of information, you know, knowledge about how climate change will unfold and what the impacts will be. Uh, but we're also seeing very large changes in uh, legal systems and civil action. I think one of the most important things that we've seen in the last few years is the increase in civil action, in marches, in direct action, um, and basically people being fed up. Uh, and I think that's how we see social change uh, and the maybe the enhancement of all the other solutions that humans are so good at, uh, at producing, things like te- technical solutions and things like that, and other so- social solutions. So um, to answer your question about the uh, disinformation, I think this is a problem. Uh, I think this is a problem that has maybe reached its nadir, hopefully. Uh, hopefully we're starting to see some real efforts uh, in improving this. There was a paper that came out last year in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that suggested that disinformation and social media specifically uh, could should be treated as a crisis uh, subject. It should be actually treated as a crisis discipline, the people who research this, because this is something that could uh, actually trigger a collapse of society, of a functioning society. And I, do, I am very worried about that. But um, I do think that we have reached the nadir in that, and I think we're hopefully uh, bringing in sort of mechanisms for addressing that. You see this with YouTube, for example, demonetizing uh, climate denial videos. Uh, you've seen it on Twitter. You've seen it on some of the social medias. It doesn't mean the problem's going away, and it's not doesn't mean that the problem is incredibly serious still. Uh, but I, I hope that we're back, coming back up from the bottom of that. But. Now, I wonder the kind of effect that your book would have had, let's say, if it was published uh, in the U.S. market, let's say, three years ago. Because I think in the last two years, to your point, there's been a tremendous amount of civil movements and collective action in particular. And we've had really that tipping point. And I wonder 
who is your book really targeted to? Uh, because given the fact that everyone is speaking the sustainability um, jargon and mm-hmm. kind of you know kind of on the on the greenwashing boat, so to speak. Yeah. So who do we need to sway and 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 how is this information and insights informing us to do what? Well, I you know. You, I, did, I address some of that greenwashing in the book, and I address that uh, it, it's quite directly in the book. What you're seeing and what, what I'm seeing in my experience, and I'm being told by a lot of people, and I'm sure you are as well, is that there is a lot of interest, and yet people are rapidly trying to upskill. They're rapidly trying to know what the situation is. They know that there's, as you say, they, they talk this talk, they somehow know that it's important, it's bubbling in all of us, I think we're starting to see the impacts and things, but there's an awful lot of people out there who really want to know uh, the details. They want to know uh, exactly why and how we got into this mess, exactly how, how and why we, uh, you know, we, we want to actually improve uh, the situation. And the number of people who still, who are very much fascinated by, um, you know, even, even the sort of, um, the introductory science uh, of um, energy systems, of food systems, you know, it's quite remarkable. And I think what we'll see is a, a rapid uh, education of workforces, uh, of uh, students. I mean, you, education was actually one of the most important parts of the recent uh, COP26 um, uh, meeting. One of the one of the real aims of that was to bring uh, uh, together a global education on the uh, on climate. Um, so I think you know that's really important. And one of the things that my book does, I hope, is not just give that vision in an actual sort of emotional sense, uh, but also provides the reader with that real handbook of the information, the the trustable, ver- verifiable scientific information on where we're at, how scary it is, uh, and what can be done done about it. Okay, so I want to come back to how scary it is uh, in just a second. But uh, one of the things you mentioned is um, this notion of education, and COP26 was very effective in that regard. Uh, but education, the dissemination of that dissemination of that education throughout the globe is is of course not equal, and then more so when you take into account specific policies within regions, sovereignties, and, and certain boundaries, it becomes mm-hmm. very heterogeneous. How do we, as a planet, as a species? create something cohesive where all the parts are generally moving in the same direction versus the policy maybe or lack of policy in New Zealand versus some of the policy, aggressive policies in EU versus kind of, well, let's see what happens in the US and other parts. I think this is the key question of our age in terms of how do we get everybody on board and putting in the same direction. Um, the world is not heter- uh, heterogeneous, uh, homogeneous, sorry. The uh, education systems are not homogeneous. Uh, the world is a very heterogeneous place. And what we see is that although there are at the moment more acceleration in the right direction, uh, that this is going at different rates, that some there are hurdles that people are falling at, these sorts of things. One of the reasons why we have failed in climate change in general and in other environmental issues which are on a global scale is exactly because we don't have the local institutions and norms to keep things in check. Human societies have often been very good at maintaining resources for the long term, as long as we all know each other, uh, as long as we work in groups that are able to uh, sanction uh, bad actors. Uh, And one of the reasons why we're now in such trouble is because we work in a globalized system that doesn't have the same checks uh, on the impact that we have in terms of the environment. One of the most important things going forwards is potentially things like the carbon border adjustment mechanism that the EU is bringing in. And this is going to be levying carbon taxes on anything coming into the EU, being imported into the EU. And the academic research seems to suggest on this is that you can actually get a global carbon tax uh, incentivized Mm -hmm. through a a patchwork of other carbon prices around the world, as long as there are these uh, border adjustments going in. None of this is going to be fast enough, and we can move on to the the scary point uh, in a moment, but um, this is how you could see a future whereby this quilt, that this patchwork, this quilt of different uh, carbon prices would start coming together to really sort of drive economies in those direction, in the in the right direction. Well, I mean, I mean, as a as an economist by background, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. But at the same time, practically from an implementation, it, it can be challenging in the form of levying you know, tariffs and different forms of taxes uh, that has implications to trade and and import export in the context of you know some of the inflations that we're seeing some of the relaxing of monetary policy uh, so it, it just it creates a lot more complexity than we, we can handle at this point but very valid let's go back to uh, the book itself and some of the key insights so 
paint us a balanced picture of what can we see in that kind of 20, 30, 20, 50 timeframe if things continue as is? And then what are the counterbalancing measures and solutions that we can look to to help mitigate and maybe even perhaps get us to neutral, um, not sure about carbon negative? Yeah, um, I think the important thing that we have to remember and scientists and, 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 and climate communicators have to remember is that uh, each year for the next few years, these will be the best years that we can expect. And these have been very impactful years. Uh, and so we have to uh, admit to ourselves uh, that in a real sense, uh, we have failed. Uh, but in, a, in every sense, there is everything to play for. Um, so when we look into the future, if you look at the recent uh, assessment report six from the IPCC, uh, they are very much uh, talking about um, unprecedented uh, environmental impacts, uh, extreme weather events. Uh, we are looking at severe impacts on food and energy systems. Uh, and we could even start seeing in severe impacts by the 2030s. I mean, you're starting to see impacts on food systems already. There's plenty of documented uh, issues already uh, in the 2020s. Uh, by the time that we get to the 2040s, 2050s, you're talking about significant percentage increases in the possibility of multiple yield failures in, in crops around the world uh, at a much higher rate uh, than we have previously seen. Um, and so, you know, by 2050, what I often sort of talk, try to try to really impress upon people is we are talking about food price spikes. And when we see food price spikes, say like we did in the in 2007, 2008, you see a social unrest and you see all of the sort of civil uh, issues that you see uh, around the world. So um, to some extent, um, we can do some about something about that. You know, I mean, there's all sorts of adaptations, there's all sorts of mitigations that we can do about that. But some level of that, because of the inertia of the emissions that we've already put into the atmosphere, is we have to expect, uh, because this is situation will not get better until we reach net zero. Uh, and even then, there's a small, uh, very small, uh, very unlikely, but possible uh, chance that we've actually tipped over very large scale systems in the Earth's climate uh, that would continue on uh, increasing warming for, you know, another point two to 0.5 degrees, depending. I mean, there are lots of different estimates out there. What's very important to point out to uh, your listeners and uh, uh, viewers is that there has been a systematic underestimate, underestimate of the large scale impacts of um, climate. So when we're thinking about things like the uh, loss of glaciers, the uh, loss of the Antarctic uh, and Arctic uh, ice sheet mass, when we're talking about circulation currents, um, previous IPCC reports thought that we would see these large scale tipping points at about six degrees. Current uh, IPCC reports think we will see this about two degrees. Um, and so we're going from six degrees, which is a, a obviously a lot more warming than the two degrees that we're actually sort of heading for. Uh, and there has been this systematic underestimation over time. It's true of sea level rise as well. The IPCC has done incredibly well at estimating average temperatures, but these large scale systems and how quickly they can flip and how quickly they can destabilize has been generally misunderstood. So um, that is what we're facing. Uh, and that's what we're facing uh, going on until we get to net zero and reduce the chances of those tipping points. Those tipping points aren't the same things as like uh, riots or raves. Uh, those tipping points uh, sort of unfold over centuries. And we have baked some of that in already. So sea level rise will continue for centuries, even if uh, we manage to get to zero today. Um, so we have to bear this in mind when we're going forwards. If you're thinking about what we, what, when we're looking at hope and when we're thinking about what can we really do about this, well, a lot of the things that we need to do, that we know that we need to do, uh, are going to be better for human welfare and human health generally. Uh, so when we're thinking about making the energy transition and removing uh, petrol vehicles and, and, pe uh, and fossil fuel production from the system, we're cleaning the airs. When we're thinking about removing animal agriculture, you're talking about better health for humans, you're talking about better health for um, economies even, uh, and better health for um uh, the environment's better access to nature uh, and the, these sorts of things. So we've got to always put, think about all the other things that things improve. And when we're not talking about climate, we've got biodiversity as well. And we know that a lot of the things that we have to address for climate are going to be incredibly beneficial for biodiversity when we're thinking about agriculture, uh, we're thinking about energy systems and this as well. So um, it's very um it's very important to think about how each of those different uh, technologies that, and social interventions that we can use uh, to address climate uh, issues uh, really cascades across all these other different areas of human welfare. 
I can give you an example. We, we had a paper out a couple of weeks ago and we looked at what would happen if high income nations ate a, a plant rich diet. So not cut out meat completely, not cut out dairy or eggs completely, but just plant rich, cut down meat drastically. We found that across all the high income nations around the world, you would save an area the size of the EU in land because agri animal agriculture takes 80% of all agriculture. Um, and if you use that land to draw down carbon, you'd actually double the benefit of, of going uh, towards a plant-based diet. And so you're talking about uh, almost 100 gigatons of carbon out of the atmosphere. That's about 12 years of total global agricultural emissions uh, just by having a plant-based diet. Um, and that means huge amounts of land towards nature, towards, towards access to nature as well, for us as well. And every single meta-analysis out there shows us that when we're out in nature, it reduces the chances of uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, stroke, stress, all the rest of it. So we've got to make this picture all the time that this is a new contract between producers and consumers. It's a new contract between humans and uh, nature, uh, you know, and it's a new contract between the short term and the long term, you know. Um, so I think we need to sort of keep painting that picture about what that looks like for human health and, and, and flourishing. Well, I think uh, for me, the, the takeaway that's uh, really riveting is this notion of when it comes to large scale systems and projecting or forecasting that we are underestimating and that the correlation effect and the tipping point of interdependencies is so massive that the chain of reaction is, is going to be rapid. Um, and that deterioration, it, it passes even the point when we reach point zero, meaning that the <laughs> we've already kind of the, the, you know the ball's already rolling and even if we get to a point of neutral that ball is going to continue for some time century or more um, these are very scary uh, scary uh, projections and then of course when you overlay that with aspects of social and political it becomes very problematic some countries or some economic blocks let's say EU are going to be at the forefront and and we've seen that from a policy from from fiscal, from grants and even allocation of capital to um, you know private equity and venture capital, but other areas uh, they're not going to be on the same pace, or maybe they choose to scapegoat, and this is where we're going to see even greater rise of dictators and you know those that are trying to uh, use this as an opportunity, political opportunity, to scapegoat and to create division to coalesce their power uh, power base, as an example. So there's going to be a lot more abuse before we can start to see something that is unified and improving on an overall basis. What do we do about the less the, the less developed and the devel uh, developing nations, and how should the wealthy nations um, help them? Yeah, it's um, there's two answers to this that I can think of uh, off the top of my head. One is that already the uh, development of new technologies and energy. Are astonishing and when we look at what happened to solar pv and the reductions in cost in solar pv it was faster than anybody thought i mean we are way beyond uh, where we thought we would be in terms of uh, solar pv and in wind um massive underestimations i mean we've beaten targets that we had set uh, for 2030 today now that's not good enough because we're still burning a lot of a uh, uh, fossil fuel as well but what happened there was that rich countries like uh, germany uh, made a decision that they wanted to get off uh, fossil fuels and actually nuclear. Uh, we can debate about whether that was a good idea or not, of course, but they wanted to make this energy transition towards renewables. And what did they do? They brought in feed-in tariffs and they paid for it. And by paying for it, they actually developed the entire um, uh, sort of network for the production of solar PV and brought down the prices so, so quickly. And so quickly now that uh, new PV stations are now cheaper than existing uh, fossil fuel uh, stations. Even once you've already paid off all, all of the, the fossil fuels, it's cheaper to build an entirely new uh, PV plant uh, over the long run than to continue operating a gas power plant, for example. And what that does is it opens up that technology around the world. Um, so that technology can diffuse uh, to um, middle income and lower income nations to the point where now you've got distributed grids uh, popping up all around uh, middle and lower income nations and you've got energy access, which people never had before, you know, like, and that's made such a big difference and not just energy access, electricity access. And electricity is amazing, you know, so much better than any other type of energy. Um, so that's really important. That's one side of it. The other side of it, I'm afraid, is miserably uh, pessimistic. Uh, we have done a horrible job of uh, 
really helping middle and lower income nations both mitigate and adapt to climate change. Uh, what was basically happened is the Green Climate Fund that was set up through the IPC, well, the UNFCC uh, processes to help lower income nations and say that we're in it together, uh, missed all of its targets. Those targets won't be met till 2023. And when you dig into the money that's actually been given to people, a lot of that is investments and loans. It's not grants. You know, you often think, oh, this is 100 billion, which people talk about. And and the aim was to get that by this uh, last year. Um, that's not that. That's not uh, grants. A lot of that, uh, about sort of sixty percent of that, is loans and investments. And so, imagine saying to somebody, say in Bangladesh, "Yes, we'll give you a whole bunch of money to help you adapt to climate change." Oh, and by the way, we'll have that back with uh, four to ten percent interest, whatever the interest is going to be uh, 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 given. So, it's pretty miserable, actually, the the record uh, of rich nations in helping middle and, and lower income nations. And we have to see that change if we're going to see any sort of real. Uh, pushing together on this, I think. Yeah, that's interesting, because I think if you speak to uh, Wall Street and, and certainly the capitalists, they'll tell you that uh, there's been a tremendous amount of progress around, uh, you know, financial products, green bonds, and so forth. But to your point, it, you know, the incentive structure and the ownership is completely different. Uh, and certainly if it's in the form of grants, it's an investment, it, it is an export, but for the, for the you know, country that's receiving it, that's an opportunity for them to make an investment. But yet, you know, as an example of Bangladesh, you know, now they have to figure out exactly how to repay back and service that debt as well, which is going to add to their existing debt and export import deficit. I'd say. My understanding on this is that, uh, yeah, debt debt is now spiraling and we're going to need some mm. sort of debt relief, especially on climate issues. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's mm. unsustainable at this point. Yeah. That's really interesting. Actually, that has huge economic implications uh, from an asset bubble. Um, now, Let's uh, talk a little bit about a little bit more on the solution, because I think because you focus on agriculture and energy, both of which really uh, are the primary contributors in the agriculture side, it's all about land use. Uh, when I say agriculture, it also includes cattle and, and you know, livestock as well. What are your thoughts about how scalable can we start to see around plant based momentum, clean meat, alt meat, and even new forms of technologies that's able to take the microorganisms in the air? using electrolysis, be able to infuse it with hydrogen, CO2 to, you know, basically net out at, um, you know, complete perfect protein without any land use whatsoever. So there's a lot of novel things that we're seeing, but the question is how much of that will actually make an impact as well as some of the more uh, drastic things like vertical and indoor farming that's going to be necessary in certain parts of the region, just because to your point, the yields or agriculture is going to collapse altogether at some point. Yeah, so we've got to caution ourselves a little bit about some of these technologies, because when you think about land use and you think about indoor farming, well, you're taking the land use out into the energy system, you know, and then you're talking about land, land for energy uh, and uh, for PV and wind, which do take up some space, uh, quite a lot of space. We've done research on this before. It's not unsurmountable, uh, but, you know, it's there. You've also got the embodied emissions. Uh, in building uh, the vertical farms, the concrete, the uh, machinery, these sorts of things. I'm not saying it's not worth doing. I'm saying that uh, these are very early days in penciling all of this out and how this actually, you know, looks for the, the actual problem that you're trying to address. Um, every single st study that you look at in terms of trying to see how we make the agricultural system work uh, is three main things. We need a great food transition. These three main things are um, dietary change, massive reductions in food waste and very on a much smaller amount technologies. Every single one you look mm. at in terms of what can we actually do, um, the, the vast opportunities are in dietary change and in um, food waste. Now, some technologies can help with that dietary change. Of course they can, because they will help people engage with uh, old meats, like you mentioned. Uh, and, you know, for a lot of us, you know, we have cultural you know, attitudes towards meat. You know, we grew up eating a certain type of meat and, you know, you don't want to sort of give that up. So we do need sort of these facsimiles. But I think one of the key lessons is also that, you know, maybe we just don't need to eat so much. Uh, a lot of these old meats as well, um, although they're often better than actual meat, uh, they do, um, they are often high in sodium, they are often you know, not necessarily wonderful for you. <laughs> uh, but when you're talking about sort of the, 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 the plant based diets, you know, if you're actually going to be eating um, raw uh, plants, so you're going to be eating uh, lower processed uh, foods, it's just going to be better for you. Um, so in, some of the, in terms of some of those technologies, in terms of vertical farming, there may be opportunities. I think it's going to be one of those opportunities where I think, you know, as you mentioned, you have to 
change the entire structure of the food production system, which is a very difficult thing to do. You know, one of the easier things to do is to address the dietary and waste issue uh, and then, then allow the system to change from the, to, to, to fulfill those consumer preferences. And so what I often always, I often say about dietary change, often people say, well, it's just me. I'm not going to make a difference. Well, you know, we're, it's a system made up of individuals. And the more that you eat applied based diets, the more there's incentive to produce even more products that other people mm-hmm. would like to eat. Mm-hmm. And those people might find it really difficult 10 years ago, uh, but they're going to find it really easy. Uh, in another five years because there's just so many interesting options and so one of the things I mentioned is that it's not just that this is a message of abstinence it's not a message of sacrifice it's a message message of opportunity because as it the system changes you're going to see so many more interesting options when I was you know uh, younger you couldn't go to a restaurant and order any sort of vegetarian meal you might your only vegetarian meal might be some cheese I don't, <laughs> especially in France you know just a wheel of cam- camembert or something like that um, but uh, nowadays you go and you've got five different options and the research tells us that once you have those options on the menu mm. even meat eaters are likely to experiment they're likely to get into it and they're going to find that it's quite nice to be able to explore like that, the plant-based foods. At the moment, we just rely on a, a very small set uh, of different plant foods and cereals, you know, the four main cereals, uh, you know, a handful of vegetables. Uh, in the future, we're going to see far more different types of uh, uh, varieties of food coming uh, and different types of uh, cereals, even like crenza or wheatgrass, for example, uh, cereals that will be better for um, the soils, better for the environment as well. Um, does that answer your question? I think uh... absolutely, and and actually, it actually uh, brings up more questions. Uh, but I think <laughs> we're we're kind of out of time at this point. But to your point, I mean, we're starting to see new substitutes like you know uh, duckweed and um, others, other things that's beyond just wheat and soy and so forth. So it's very exciting, and I think uh, you you bring up a really great point. It's a great way to kind of wrap up for today is the notion of choice. Um, so it's one thing to affect the supply, but if we can affect the demand side function more through choices, you give people the ability to empower themselves. And just out of curiosity, and again, I know it's not a very good metaphor example, but part of the reason Tesla has really had incredible traction and really harness the demand function is because they're not just simply talking about it's good for Earth. But you got car enthusiasts who really want to drive fast and they find that Tesla is faster and beats most other race cars. And that's why they embrace it as an example. So to your point about meat eaters, you know, they love meat, but if they see that there's other choices that provide similar characteristics and feature set that still, you know, pleases their appetite, why not? So with that, I have been joined by Professor Paul Benrens. Uh, Thank you so much for joining and thank you for this lively conversation. Thanks, Cole. This is great. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.